haven't talked about tonight was if you look at uh, Osceola County in Florida, uh, if you look at that county, you'll see that Donald Trump right now uh, is winning that county. That is a very heavy Puerto Rican county. And if you go look at 2020, uh, he lost that county by what, 12, 13 points. It's a pretty amazing thing. Um, the other thing that's going on right now is Virginia is about tied with about 40 to 45 percent of the vote in, which is one of the things that political folks out there look at because it's a pretty quick state. They close at 7 p.m. And for a lot of us, we look at Virginia to kind of get a sense on where things are at around the country. And Rick, dive into some of these counties in Virginia, what we're seeing so far. Yeah, I mean, the one thing that is getting a lot of attention so far is Loudoun County. These are suburbs and kind of extended areas uh, outside Washington, D.C. This is the part that, of the state that has made Virginia a, essentially a blue state at the national level. And it's a place that you can see Hillary Clinton getting about 56 percent. Joe Biden goes up to 61. So far tonight, it's about 95 percent of the vote in. Harris is looking more like Hillary Clinton in Virginia. Now, she won the state as well, but that's not the kind of trend line you'd want. And again, these are highly educated suburban voters. These are places where you'd expect Harris to do extremely well. Um, she's going to be hitting her benchmarks. I don't think it's a real concern in the, Har in the Harris campaign right now. But as you know that, that Donald Trump is going to be running up his numbers in more conservative parts of the state, this is where, this is where you, the, Reince is right, that it, it could be a warning sign for other trends we're seeing elsewhere in the country. Or a tighter race than it was four years ago. Definitely, definitely that. I mean, we can look at a state like Florida right now, which is going overwhelmingly Republican. Uh, I don't think we're going to see the same kind of a trend in a Virginia, but we're not seeing Democrats overperform in the same way Republicans are in, in, a, in a red state of Florida. Let's go to Whit Johnson at Trump uh, headquarters. Uh, and with, on this reporting on the gender gap and this uh, outreach to male voters, and in particular young men, and, and as you heard John Carl uh, report just a moment ago, this, this 11th hour push, if you know any men out there, get out and vote. Yeah, David, the Trump campaign has been laser focused on the young men. And in fact, they've been giving us updates throughout the evening. And they've said that some of the results coming in, I'll, you know, of course, Rick can check me on all of this, but saying that Latino men in some key areas are breaking for Trump. They've also said that uh, Trump is doing better with women that Kamala Harris is doing with men. That's something that we heard uh, from the Trump campaign with the early vote coming in. And I can tell you just anecdotally, uh, as this crowd is starting to fill in here, the thousands of people who are gonna be at this uh, election night reception here, there are a lot of young men in the audience here. I was at Madison Square Garden uh, with that big rally there, some 20,000 people. And I spoke to a lot of these young men and asked them what it was about Donald Trump that appealed to them. Many of them either weren't old enough to vote before or maybe didn't participate in politics in the past, but they were drawn to him for a variety of reasons. Immigration and the economy were a big part of it. A lot of these young men who feel like the, the middle class American dream is difficult to achieve, difficult to reach. They felt like they could connect with Trump and he was the man who could help them get there. But we've seen things like the podcast with Joe Rogan, Hulk Hogan, uh, UFC President Dana White, Elon Musk uh, around the Trump campaign. All of that has been an effort uh, to draw young men in. And even Baron Trump, who is now 18 years old, by the way, Donald Trump's youngest son, uh, who Donald Trump calls a tech genius, has actually been involved in very hands-on and trying to book some of these podcasts to, to appeal to young men. So the Trump campaign has gone all in. They have thousands of volunteers who are specifically focused on those low propensity voters, the voters who didn't participate in the past. And tonight will be a big test if that gamble pays off. David? Whit Johnson at Trump headquarters in Florida. Whit Johnson, our, uh, our thanks to you. And we're going to drill down on Latino voters, what we're seeing from the exit polls in Florida, what we can extrapolate uh, nationwide, uh, and how Kamala Harris is performing among Latino voters uh, as well, in addition to the Trump campaign's outreach to try to, to peel away some of the Latino support for, for Joe Biden four years ago. And Maria Elena Salinas is standing by, what she's seeing in the numbers here tonight, too, uh, right after the break. Don't go away. ABC News live coverage of the presidential election continues right after this. ABC's David Muir. The your voice, your vote. The race for the White House. Election night 2024 continues. Here again, David Muir.
Welcome back. Let's go right to the path to 270, where things stand at this hour. Donald Trump uh, picking up 10 states on the race to 270. Kamala Harris picking up three states and now stands at 27 electoral votes to 105 electoral votes. Again, early in the night. But I do want to uh, drill down on what we're learning from Florida. There's been a lot of focus on Florida, which used to be a battleground state, now uh, far uh, more red than it was even just a decade ago. What are we seeing as far as Latino voters, uh, Lindsay, in Florida? This is kind of foreboding potentially for the Harris campaign. When you take a look at the Hesp- uh, the Hispanic and Latino vote in Florida, 24 percent, they account for the electorate. Look at this. Donald Trump leading by 16 points over Kamala Harris. He's getting 57 percent of the vote. He's actually doing 11 points better with Latinos than he did in 2020. And Republicans actually haven't won the Latino vote since 2004. Now, some people might say, well, you know, there are a lot of Cuban voters in particular in Florida, but still she's actually underperforming. And and Cuban voters tend to go with Republicans, so that's not so unusual. But she's also underperforming with the Latino vote when it comes to battleground states of Georgia and also Pennsylvania. So let's bring in Maria Elena Salinas, uh, who knows this uh, obviously very well. Uh, and she's with us here for our coverage tonight. Uh, Maria, what are you seeing as far as uh, how Kamala Harris is doing among Latino voters uh, really across these battlegrounds? Well, across the battleground states, and just let's remember that there are hundreds of thousands of Latino voters in all of the battleground states. And, you know, David, President Joe Biden did very well with Latino voters in 2020, with 65% of the vote versus 32% for them, President Trump. And Vice President Harris' support among Hispanics is a bit lower. The latest ABC uh, poll had uh, Vice President Harris at 54% versus 39% for former President Trump. But it's not all bad news for Vice President Harris because when she entered the race just over 100 days ago, the numbers were much lower. And she's been able to increase her numbers as Latino voters voters got to know her, especially women and young Latinas. She's been doing a lot of outreach with Latino voters across the country, hoping her own immigrant story will resonate with them. I think the challenge for her, David, has been that like most voters, the top issues for Latinos are the economy, inflation, crime and immigration. And we know that former President Trump does better on those issues. Now, there is anecdotal indications and some polling on Spanish language media that shows that the so-called joke at Madison Square Garden calling Puerto Rico Florida island of garbage has moved some Puerto Rican voters her way in Pennsylvania, you know, home to over 400,000 Puerto Rican voters, as well as North Carolina and Georgia with hundreds of thousands. And here in Florida, where Puerto Ricans are the second largest Latino voting bloc, I know previous said that they were leaning towards Trump, but you know we have to wait to, till we see those results. There's also indication that the insult of, on Puerto Rico could have influence Um, on other Latino voters who have expressed outrage at the incident in solidarity with Puerto Ricans. They say an insult to one of ours is an insult to all. Maria Lena Salinas, I really appreciate that. Governor Christie, I wanted to bring this over to you because Florida really has changed uh, over the course of uh, of several years here. And and obviously a goal of the Trump campaign was to try to peel back some of this Latino support that Biden was successful with four years ago. Well, let's look at a constant now over the last 14 years. And the constant over the last 14 years of Florida is Rick Scott, right? So Rick Scott gets elected in 2010 by a point and a half. He gets reelected by a point. Then he runs for the Senate. He wins by 13 one hundredths of a point. And tonight he's up by 12. What happened between 2018 and 2022 COVID? Florida has been invaded by conservative voters from blue states during COVID who felt that the blue straight restrictions were too tight, and they left. And so to say that the electorate in Florida hasn't changed, it's changed drastically from 2018 to now. And for certainly, Rick Scott's numbers show it. Rick Scott has never been a big winner in Florida. He's been a barely winner, point and a half point, 13 one hundredths of a point. Now all of a sudden, Rick Scott's winning by 12 tonight. What you're seeing is that electorate has changed because of COVID significantly in Florida. And that's why tonight you see the abortion referendum is losing. The marijuana legalization referendum is losing. All of that shows that it's trending much redder in Florida. And I believe it's the influx of people from 2020 to 2024, driven mostly by COVID. And who are now calling Florida home. Yep. Uh, Let's go over to Rick Klein. Uh, Rick, let's check out Georgia. Where are we at this hour? 
Yeah, we're starting to get a significant amount of vote in, almost two-thirds of the vote. And I'm starting to focus also on the vote margin between the candidates. Right now, Donald Trump by about 190,000 votes. There's still a lot of vote to go, especially in the, in the Atlanta metro area. But we do have numbers out of Fulton County and DeKalb County. These are, these are really the, the Democratic bases. Kamala Harris doing about what she needs to do in some of these places. But if you move a little bit further out, you start to get a different portrait. Fayette County, we're keeping an eye on right now, a slight Trump edge and big Trump numbers where he needs to be overperforming, uh, hitting his benchmark almost exactly in Cherokee County, north of the city. The story so far really is the election day vote being heavily Republican. Uh, that's a problem for, for Kamala Harris because of the imbalance that we talked about in the early vote. We didn't have as much of a Democratic imbalance this time, so Democrats need to have a bigger election day. We're just not seeing signs of that yet. There's still a lot out, you know, again, about a third of the vote overall. But you start to see stubborn margins come in, especially when good chunks of the vote are coming in already from the largest counties in the state. And wh where's the benchmark for Fulton County? Where does she need to be to be performing? Well, she's, she's just yeah, below she's, it. She's about a point below that. And, and just to put in perspective, Fulton County is 178,000 advantage for Kamala Harris, and she's down by 200,000. To think about how, how far she'd be behind without the reporting we see from these two counties right next to each other, that's an enormous, enormous amount of vote. And it's vote that's already banked. Now, we'll see what comes in. There's going to be a lot of election day vote in those in, in counties like that and throughout the elect Atlanta metro area. And these great Gray spots on our map are just places we don't have enough data to tell you, is it going to tip to one direction or the other? So there's still some blank spots to be filled in. But again, as this number grows and this number stays stubbornly high, that's a problem for the Harris campaign. And how much of this is early vote versus day of? Is all of the early vote in now? Uh, we're getting almost almost all of about 80 percent of the expected early vote in so far. And it is a large number. And here is where Trump is leading that again, a little bit of a change from previous cycles, maybe a reversion to people's historic norms of how they voted. But Trump winning in that early vote, that is a large portion of the vote in Georgia overall. All right. Rick Klein showing us uh, the dynamic of the early vote this time around. Donald Trump embracing the early vote uh, with his supporters. Uh, they did turn out uh, in force. And we have to wait and see how in some of these other battleground states, how that's going to play out. Donald Trump leading in Georgia at this hour. When we're closing into the nine o'clock hour here, polls close in about 15 states, including the key battleground of Arizona, Michigan and Wisconsin as well. Your local news is standing by and our live election night coverage continues in just a moment right here on ABC.